inheritance, a lot of you out there listening are either looking at how you might pass an inheritance on, but several or many people listening might get an inheritance. And so the question is, well, then what? Okay. And one of the, what's one of the things that is similar to uh, between receiving an inheritance or winning the lottery? Free money. It's free money. Yep. Money that's free. Is that all of a sudden people will, it's, it's like a new resource in their life. So what do you do with it? Spend it. Right. And it can be gone in a hurry. So, but what compounds things in an inheritance environment is that there are certain things that you may inherit that you could really increase the tax bill dramatically on, but with a little bit of planning, you may save yourself a ton in taxes. Now, what's one very low cost thing you could do with a bank account that would help to mitigate or avoid probate? You could, if you knew who you wanted to leave the money to, you could add them as a pay on death payee. Correct, so oftentimes known as a transfer on death or a TOD. And that, that way, they don't have any, whoever you're leaving the money to does not have any control over it until you actually die, but then it's theirs without going through probate. Derek, would you say that the probate process has changed much over the last five to 10 years? I, I don't know that the process itself has changed much. I know that it's gotten really more expensive. I've yeah. heard that. Now, yeah. I, don't, I don't handle probates myself, but I'm hearing that probate can cost eight to $10,000 for one where people aren't fighting. Right. And this is in wow. the state of Oregon, primarily the, what we're talking about when we're talking about probate. So depending on where you're listening or watching this thing, it could, you know, your mileage may vary wherever you're at. But yeah. It, it, and why is this so important? Well, I mean, if you're looking at the heirs, the people who are going to inherit things, if the cost of the trust is maybe, you know, less than that $10,000 mark in a probate it, court. It might make sense to pay some to avoid probate. Right, exactly. exactly. This is where we, yeah, we we, we caught Matt on that one, right? Because he, he just dropped an Easter egg into his comment if you were paying attention, which is you could get a trust, which is a form of pre-planning that's designed to avoid probate, right? And it used to be that people think, oh, trusts, they're so expensive. Why don't I just have a will and then go into probate? But it may actually be, cheaper to do a trust now with the rising cost of probate. Yeah, the mm -hmm. one the one good thing about probate is they charge you after you're dead. True, but right, if so you're you worried, don't have to pay up yeah, front. You don't right. have to. But if you're if you're worried about how much your your heirs are going to inherit, then uh it's going to come out of their pocket. So then it's come out either while you're alive or it comes out after you're dead and then you kind of want the lower number at that point. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And of course, since this was not supposed to be the probate show. Okay? It wasn't. We're talking right. about inheritance. Right. So we did we did bank accounts. Bank accounts. What are some other things that you could inherit that a car, a truck, a vehicle? Okay, sort. vehicles. All right. So what happens if you inherit a vehicle? Well, there is you a get an oil change. Or wait, that's not what we meant. Yes, you do you you have to get your name on the title. And that and that is a probate thing. <laughs> well, it can be. It can be. And I um, I have not seen that the DMV in Oregon requires you to go through probate every time. Lots of times they'll accept alternate mechanisms gotcha. of proof so that you're the right a person. Certificate but, or something similar. Yeah. So that's a possibility. Yeah. The issue is if the chain of custody is confusing, right? If you may have a vehicle. Let's say you're married, right? You have a vehicle in one person's name. DV may be more inclined to allow the spouse that was obvious to right. take title. But if it's a next generation, now there's a, a it's a, it's more ambiguous what the chain of custody then would they been. they may want to see a will even if it's not probated. Right. And we're not speaking for the DMV, by the way. And again, your mileage may vary. And your DMV may vary. I don't even know. So should it? So Usually. that's that's vehicle. A uh, third one might be real estate. Real estate, so another titled asset. Real estate is either going to go through probate to change the title from the dead person's name to the people who are inheriting his name, or it could use a transfer on death um, mechanism to pass without going through probate, but it does make it a little bit hard to sell the property for about 18 months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there, then, but, but that's what you usually do is the kids who inherit or whoever's going to inherit has a choice. I'm either going to live in it or I'm going to sell it, one or the other. And so what what the inheritor intends to do with it makes a difference on 
what the owner does in the first place. Okay, so we've covered real estate. We've covered personal property items, right? Thing, well, I guess that's really more like things with title, vehicles we've talked about. Right. So what about personal property? Things that don't have title associated. Yeah, so those are technically supposed to go through probate. Exactly. And yet, and yet they often don't. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things that uh, it's kind of, hard to account for sometimes. And it's one of the big challenges in a, especially in a contested environment is, well, what happens when something just walks away in the process? How do you prove probate where it went? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, can be, uh, that can be one of those things people fight about. Yeah, I can remember a story of family members and they said, well, what happened to the tractor, right? That sort of disappeared from the premise. Of course, tractors have titles associated with them. So that ultimately uh, you know, found its way to resolution and it was awkward because you can't just leave and say, I have no idea what happened to it. Well, that's funny because trying to register that thing, we discovered. It's uh, in your garage. Right, right. <laughs> so who knew, right? Uh, so here's, I think Matt, you asked one of the tricky ones right out of the gate, okay? Yeah, and I had to do a lot of talking up front because I don't know the answer to what happens to an IRA. Right. Well, the good news is we do. But the first question I would ask Matt is, what kind of IRA? Right. I mean, first of all, how many types of IRAs are There's there? There's so many. You have your traditional IRA, your Roth IRA, your simple IRA, your SEP IRA. There's a lot of different types of IRAs. Yep. And, and then there's a lot of things that walk and talk like IRAs, but they're not actually IRAs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there are some things that they all have in common, right? Right. And so I think it's probably worth us talking about some of the things they all have in common and then what are some of the differences are. Well, the easy one is beneficiaries. They do all have beneficiaries, okay? Which you're, you can be a beneficiary to a will. Of course, True. there's beneficiary pathway through probate. Mm -hmm. You could be a beneficiary in a trust. That should be a pathway without probate. Or you can be a beneficiary in a retirement plan. What the heck does that mean? Mm. As I understand it, this is money that can't come to me all at once. Or maybe it could, well, but it sucks. Yeah, so it can, but the question is, is that the smart move? So first, let's paint the picture. There's two big buckets of IRA money, right? This is an example. Yeah, yeah. so you have Roth IRA money or traditional tax-deferred type IRA money. Now, that, that tax-deferred so two bucket, IRAs, traditional they're, they're, IRA, They're different Roth pathways, IRA. right? Mm -hmm. Let's think of it simply as, uh, there, there's a third hybrid, it's the most obnoxious one, but let's understand Roth and traditional first, okay? A traditional IRA, and this is going to be a, like most of your employee-er-sponsored retirement plans. The stuff you haven't paid taxes on. No yet. taxes yeah. have come out. Yeah, you, you earn the money, and before it's taxed, we pull it out, put it into an investment, and it is allowed to grow tax-deferred. And then in the future, you take the money out. And when you take it out, you pay the taxes as income in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other basket is the Roth basket, which is you earn money, you pay the taxes. And then with what's left after you've already paid your taxes, you invest it and then it grows tax deferred. And if you qualify, we've done other shows about this, right? There's the five year rule and some, you know, really kind of weird stuff around it. But basically, assuming the Roth is sort of the switch is turned on and it's acting like a real Roth with no gotchas. So after five years, most of the time, then when you take the money out after full retirement age, another important caveat, tax free, right? You paid all the taxes up front. So no taxes on the, on the back end. The other one, you don't pay the taxes up front. So you get taxed on the back end. And those are the two big baskets. Now, there's a third one that throws everybody off. Is this a smaller basket or multicolored or what? So, yes. Okay. Smaller, multicolored. Uh, it's kind of the way annuities work. Okay. This is the scenario where you make too much money to deduct an IRA contribution. So, you make an after-tax traditional IRA contribution, and then it grows tax deferred. And when it comes out, some of the money was taxed and some wasn't. And you actually have to track it 
to tell the IRS so that you can keep track of how much tax you have to pay on that. So what I hear you saying is, if this is a problem you have, call Dave and Matt offline Yep, because almost nobody has this problem. That is correct. And it's it's a really interesting tax planning strategy. It's also the front door into the back door Roth IRA strategy. Okay. So why are you? That was funny. The the front door to the back door Roth IRA. That was a little bit of a financial advisor kind of almost joke a little bit. Yeah, yeah. because we're hilarious as financial advisors. So there you go. all right, the traditional IRA this is going to be a lot like your 401ks. It's going to be a lot like a 403b if you're in the the uh, like uh, public sector, or you know even like the IAP program for PERS. Any of these, you haven't been taxed on the money yet. So somebody has it. They're in retirement. They're they're pulling it out, paying taxes as they go, and they croak. It's a technical term, right? And now, Dave, you inherit this IRA. Right. Mm-hmm. So first of all, I'm I'm curious how I knew them. Right. Yeah. There's and why does that matter? Because if you're a spouse, then you've got different options than if you're not. Mm. Right. Why does this matter? Like, first of all, a lot of people may be thinking, oh yeah, do I have that rich uncle in Zimbabwe that's finally going to come through? Right. Or if you're married and you and you lose your spouse and they had a retirement plan in their name. Well, you're going to get some options. One of them is you can leave the money in their name and carry on until uh, uh, the other is you can roll the money over into your own name. There's pros and cons based on your age, right? As to why you would do one or the other. And again, I'm not going to go super deep on the radio on this. I'm going to tell you, this is where if you don't understand the nuances, find a tax advisor or financial planner that can help you with this, mm-hmm. right? And if you don't know one, Matt will shamelessly give you our phone number. Yep, 541-375-0898. Okay. Or you can even go to our website at littlejohnfs.com. Right, because really everybody's well circumstances, coached. you know, yes, you nailed that, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, but that's the, between spouses, you get some options because the law allows you an unlimited transfer of assets between spouses without a tax effect is nice. But what if it's not your spouse? Say it's a kid, it's, you know, somebody else that you, you know, but it's a person, right? If you give it to a charity, we don't worry about that. Okay, that's great. They're going to take the money. And if the charity doesn't pay taxes, they're not paying taxes on what they get. But let's say you're, you've are you got a, a kid that's going to inherit this. What are their options when they inherit well, under current tax rules? You could open something called a beneficiary IRA and then transfer those funds into the beneficiary IRA. That is correct. That's one option. Mm -hmm. So let's start with what's probably the less than ideal option typically. Pull all the money out. There was $500,000 in there. You pulled it all out because you wanted to go on a spending bender. Yeah, and Matt, that was really going to help my Walmart trip, man. The, yeah, I know. Anything you, else is going to be less happy for right, my Walmart trip. So you're going to pull a Shaquille O'Neal and go to Walmart and drop $600,000. So so you're going to just, you're going to inherit a big chunk of money. And why do I say big? Because if you're going to inherit 500 bucks, it's probably not that big a deal. Right. If you're going to inherit 500,000 mm-hmm. or more even, right. If you took what that, happens if you just cash the thing out and put it in your checking well, if account? if you pulled that I'm money gonna, out of a traditional IRA, that's now $500,000 of income for that, the year. And you're going to hit the highest tax bracket. Mm-hmm. Okay, talk to me about this. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm leading the witness here, but I just want you guys to explain to our listeners, what do you mean? Okay, well, there's a graduated tax rate. If I only make $15,000 a year, I'm not going to pay much taxes. If I make $500,000 a year, I am going to make a much pay a much higher percentage of those uh, of that. And I think I go from like the 0% bracket to the 28% federal bracket. I think it's 37 right Holy now. smokes. Yeah, it's high. And then tack on another, what, 9, 10%, 12, maybe 9.8% 9. 9. 9. in Oregon, I think, at that level. Okay. Yeah. These, I mean, don't quote me on this. Right. I'm pulling off it's a lot. Head. You could lose almost half of it is what we're trying to say. Yep. Whereas if I string it, if I string it out for longer and don't take it all at once, then it's smaller bite-sized chunks right. that keep me believe, below the thresholds. Yeah, I believe you have like 10 years to take that money out. Correct. This is the, this is the key here. If you were to just take all the money at once out of, as a beneficiary, just take a check, put it in your checking account. That's accepting all of the money at once. 
And the IRS says, great, then all of the taxes that have been deferred showed up at the door with this inheritance. And you just said, you're going to pay them all to me right now. So we're going to take all that money and apply it, the tax bracket to it right now. And it's going to drive your taxes way up. And that's one of the interesting things about retirement accounts versus anything else you're going to inherit. Anything else you're going to inherit, you're probably not going to get it until after the taxes have been paid. But an IRA is going to come with a, a, a pre-tax IRA is going to come with a tax obligation attached to it. Right. This incidentally is also true for annuities. Okay. So an annuity has that similar issue is that the money that the tax that's been deferred, that deferral doesn't disappear when you die. It gets inherited by the heir. So that's the key. Now, remember, annuities, just like that weird hybrid, some of it was taxed and some of it wasn't, some money is usually after tax and some of it is pre-tax. So it's a mix of what you're going to be taxed on because some of it you already paid, the tax was already paid, Okay. So it just depends on how the, the, the accounts were structured. But the IRS looks at it pretty simply. They get you on the way in or they get you on the way out. And they only tax stuff that hasn't been taxed already. And let's not talk about C Corps. Okay. <laughs> so so uh, in an IRA situation, if I'm going to inherit an IRA, is the general rule that I'm always going to want to string it out? So not necessarily, but if it's a big IRA the general rule is that you'd probably want to string it out. And, and you may not need to string it out for 10 years. Okay. Right. That you have up to 10 years with which to determine when to take the distributions. This is a change, by the way, from years past. You used to have different circumstance, not worth discussing because that's not the rules anymore. But today, up to 10 years to make these withdrawals. If you're going to inherit this thing, you ask the question, Derek, you know, do you want to take it all at once? I think. Right. And... The answer is, well, it depends. The thing I said was, don't we always want to string it out? Right. And, and then and, you said no. And I said, the answer is, it depends on Dollar your effective amount. tax rate, right? Mm -hmm. If it's a really big account, you probably want to stretch it out because, you know, you don't necessarily want to give way more away in taxes unless there's a really good reason. Like you just have to, you know, get a hold of, to purchase something else. If so, yeah. if I'm in a really high tax bracket today right now, but I know mm -hmm. that I'm going to retire in a year or two, I might wait till I have low income earning years and then I might pull a bunch of it out. Yeah. You, you, and the idea is you're, I use this term a lot, right? You want to bully your tax rate. Mm -hmm. Okay. And bullying your tax rate is kind of like, yeah, you go push it around, right? Huh? You, what did you, you want a piece of this? No, no. What I'm going to do is I'm going to push you into the lowest tax environment I can. So I'm going to shift it around into different years, mm -hmm. or I'm going to try to shift it into different types of assets that will change the way it gets taxed if possible. So that's the idea when you're planning, when you're trying to be tax aware, is to try to find the areas where your tax exposure is going to be lower. And if you can't make it lower, then you spread it out so that you're not driving it even higher. Because the way progressive tax codes work the last dollar in is the most expensive to be taxed, right? We didn't talk about effective tax rate initially. We talked about highest tax rate, okay? So once you, you know, if you, it, the, if you have half a million dollars, you're, you finish in the highest tax bracket, but you didn't start in the highest. So your, your blended rate, rate is less than your maximum rate. But for each additional dollar you take in that maximum bracket, you're moving your blended rate higher. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it's a more expensive tax for each additional dollar that you withdraw. So that's why we tend to stretch this stuff out. So big account, stretch it out unless you can see into the future and you know that the tax rates are going to double next Correct. year. Yes. If you're clairvoyant, you should make really good decisions. You really. Yeah. You already know the answer. You wouldn't even have to tell you, you know, the answer. Yes. So in fact, if you know the answer, because you can predict the future, please call us. <laughs>